why is the American administration protecting uh, Panun? And we have a very robust uh, freedom of speech that exists that's different than the freedom of speech that exists here. In order to get a criminal conviction in the United States of America, you have to actually be taking action, not just making speech. India has been through fire on mm -hmm. the Khalistan issue, mm -hmm. and it seems like we are back to the same page where we just don't trust the Americans mm -hmm. on the Khalistan issue. Why are Americans stone deaf to that? Well, I, I would, again, reframe it. I don't think that we are at all. Many of us know that history. Conversely, I think in the United States, the strength of that feeling isn't enough to break the law that we have. And it's very important for us to not only be sensitive and to work more closely than ever. Anybody out there who says we're tone deaf. You spoke about uh, human rights and citizens' mm -hmm. amendment bill. Mm -hmm. uh, that became a little bit of naughty affair. Do you see this as a problem area mm -hmm. now with an in American ambassador commenting on India's internal affairs? That religious freedom is an important part of any democracy. Um, mm -hmm. Protecting minorities is very important. That doesn't have to be read negatively. If an Indian ambassador was to say, comment on the judicial system uh, of America, that would be seen as yeah. interference. And, and I think it's the job of monitoring what happens. That's the job of an ambassador. That's the job of a State Department, Ministry of External Affairs job. And Indian ambassador's job is to monitor and to report. And we simply said that. If, mm. if people want to read new words besides that into it, they can. The attack on Indian students. So can you just, uh, you know, there are a number of Indian parents who are watching this podcast. Students who are watching. We take the justice issues very seriously of bringing to justice any perpetrators with, you know, a quarter million now a year. Statistically, this is going to happen. Uh, president Joe Biden and uh, Prime Minister Modi both are going in for re-election. Your president has said, and I quote, uh, that uh, the partnership with uh, India is uh, the most consequential in the world. Um, is it hyperbole or is it really true? He has said that privately. He told that to me. He said, Eric, you know, this is the most important country in the world to me when he was asking me to become ambassador. He meant it because I heard him say it that, that directly in the Oval Office to the prime minister. That this is the most consequential relationship. India and the U.S. are showing their resilience and that we really want this relationship for the long haul. So as we learn each other's systems, as we have momentary conflicts, if we can get through these, I think it's a great thing for the world. Namaste Jai Hind, welcome to another edition of the ANI podcast with Smita Prakash. Thank you for liking and subscribing to the channel and sharing these conversations with people who you think will benefit from listening or watching them. My guest today is the US ambassador to India, Eric Garcetti. A former two-term mayor of Los Angeles City, in 2020, Garcetti had admitted that he wanted to run for the president of the US. He had even visited several early primary states, including New Hampshire, Iowa and South Carolina. But then he dropped out and after two years of complicated procedure, Eric Garcetti finally got the job as the next US ambassador to India. In the podcast, we shall discuss many aspects of the India-US partnership, as also the recent comment by the ambassador on the Citizenship Amendment Act, which evoked an unnaturally sharp reaction from the Indian External Affairs Minister. Thank you, Ambassador Garcetti, for coming to the podcast. It's um, a pleasure. I look forward to having a chat with you. There's so much I want to talk about India-US relations. Uh, but before that, the absolute news of the day, because even as we record this bulletin, uh, there's been a press conference in Moscow, and uh, President Putin has uh, has accepted that it was uh, Islamic terrorists of the ISIS he didn't say ISIS, I think he just said Islamic terrorists who conducted it. But he seemed to insinuate that um, uh, there was the deep state involved in it. Uh, there was also the uh, the advisory that the Americans had put out before uh, the attack took place, which means which gets all the conspiracy theorists out there to say the Americans had prior knowledge of this attack. So can you just uh, explain about all this to us? Well, first, let me, as a human being, just condemn the terrorism, um, sympathize with the victims, the families of the victims. This is a common problem mm. across the world when we see terrorism that threatens literally every state in the world in one way or another, uh, whether it is a Western state, whether it's a developing state, whether it's even a Muslim state or not. We see terrorism of all sorts of stripes being one of the greatest threats that continues. And this tragedy, just as a human being, as a father, as, as a person, um, strikes me um, as one of the worst incidents we've seen in a long time. Secondly, certain things transcend even geopolitics, which is humanity, uh, whether it is 
warning somebody that you're in conflict with, that you have um, indicators of an imminent attack, which we shared with the Russians, even though obviously we're at odds uh, on things like the Ukraine war, the unwarranted invasion of Ukraine. Um, other things in moments like this, as we did uh, transcend the politics of that day to say, we condemn this, we sympathize with you. And look, we stand actually united with any country, mm -hmm. um, friend or foe against the common enemy of terrorism. That's something that I think every nation must say is unacceptable to human beings, to innocent people who are going to a concert. Um, and, you know, conspiracy theorists will always have conspiracies. We can 100% rebut those. Those are absolutely mm -hmm. false. It's mm -hmm. not who America is. It's not what we stand for. And the evidence is not just in the warnings, but also in the condemnation and any willingness to work to root out terrorism together anywhere. The Russians uh, keep saying that, you know, the ISIS doesn't target American uh, American assets. They don't do that. And uh, it's only the non-Americans. So when ISIS attacks them, because now it seems evident that it's the ISIS attacks uh, in that uh, Moscow uh, strike. Um, so the Americans have been, the State Department has quickly come out and said, or the White House has quickly given a clean shit to the Ukrainians in this. Uh, it seemed like too sudden to give a clean shit and say the Ukraine, there was no Ukrainian uh, involvement in this uh, attack? Uh, stupid fires need to be put out immediately. Mm -hmm. And with all due respect, that's a stupid fire. That is, couldn't be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and we not only indicate there's no evidence, but as that gathers, the more you even restate the false accusation, the more oxygen that fire gets. Mm -hmm. And it's also a false uh, statement that we have not been the target of ISIS. We've been the target of ISIS for years, uh, for decades now, unfortunately, since uh, the beginning of ISIS. We've actively fought war against them and their terrorist ways, the ways they've enslaved women, the ways they've gone after religious minorities, uh, their extremist brand of politics and of their fundamental beliefs. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. We. This is a common enemy. Um, if folks want to take a tragedy like this and make it even more tragic with lies, that's their decision. Uh, but we stand in solidarity with the victims and we stand in solidarity with any victims of terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get on to uh, India-US <laughs> relations. Um, as ambassador, um, let's talk about the areas of dissonance before we talk about areas of convergence. Um, why is the why is the state administration, why is the American administration protecting uh, Panun, Gurpatwan Well, let's Panun. start actually with convergence, because I know maybe the bad news sells, but I, I, I think anybody listening should know that this is the deepest, strongest relationship that we've ever had in the history of our two nations. And it's so exciting to be ambassador at this moment, when not only can we talk about great things together and move forward, but when there's ever areas of dissonance or disagreement, we actually manage those incredibly well. It's like a healthy marriage. You know, you don't agree all the time on everything with the person you love, but there is deep love, deep affinity, deep, you know, real friendship that I think is not just government to government, but people to people. Um, and I would reframe how you said it. We take seriously any threats or any criminal activities that are referred to us in our own country uh, from India or concerns that India has about its own national security. Every single time. There isn't a single time where we say, nope, sorry, won't look at that. Mm. We take very seriously looking at it, but we also have had wonderful engagements, even in the last couple of weeks, of understanding each other's systems, which unfortunately, the two vibrant democracies, the two biggest democracies in the world, but aren't exactly the same. Things have to always li line up here to a level of evidence that would work in the Indian courts, same things in the United States. Um, and we have a very robust uh, freedom of speech that exists that's different than the freedom of speech that exists here. In order to get a criminal conviction in the United States of America, you have to actually be taking action, not just making speech. But we take very seriously the threat against Indian diplomats. We take very seriously the criminal activities of transnational criminal enterprises that may, one, have you know drug dealing, or two, arms running, or three, human trafficking. We're seeing a lot of that on our southern border actually originating from India, um, where now Indians are the third largest group of unlawful entrants to the United States. So 
Um, I just, I would reframe it because I don't think that's the right framing to say that anybody's protected. Uh, nobody is protected from our laws, period. Doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what you do. If you break the law, you will be held accountable in the United States. If the question is why isn't somebody sent to uh, India just because India asked for them, that's the training we're doing together with both of our law enforcement. And that would work for somebody coming from India to the U.S. to understand those systems and to make sure it's successful in a court of law. You know, uh, you said you spoke about freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Gurpat Tuan Singh Pannu has, it's not just speech. He, uh, just this week, uh, last week, mm -hmm. he spoke about election interference and said there was active election interference where uh, funds were released to one of the political parties in India. I'm uh, mm -hmm. agnostic about which political party mm -hmm. and whether it's the BJP, the Aan Mahadbi party, doesn't matter. The fact is that he has actively said that funds were transferred to one political party. That's election interference. Threat to the Prime Minister. Open threat to the Prime Minister. Open threat to air safety, where he threatens uh, that uh, Air India will be bombed. These are... These are uh, violent threats. I, I, I very much respect what you're saying. Uh, tend to agree when people do step over the line saying something will be bombed as opposed to saying somebody shouldn't fly. The, the United States freedom of speech, we want success for anybody if there's a criminal accusation to actually reach the threshold that would have a successful outcome. And I'm not speaking about the specific case in anything. Mm. And we are helping our Indian counterparts understand that people can express opinions like, oh, I think this is going to happen. American citizens, by the way. Um, and under our law, for an American citizen to be convicted in an American court or to be deported to have um, a, a criminal case in another country, it has to meet our law. And so we'll continue working. And if anybody ever says something that steps over that line, and I know it's gotten very close, we will be working together on that. So uh, basically right now the investigation against Gurpat Van Singh Pannu is Americans convincing or trying to convince Indian authorities that he is within the law in doing what he's doing. No. Each incident is looked at each time. And if the Indian government ever brings up something, if they gave up something today, we'd be looking at it tomorrow. It's not an ongoing investigation of a person. That's not how our criminal justice system works. Mm -hmm. It's we believe there's an act. If a friend from another country is saying this is an act that transcends a border, mm -hmm. we will always look at that, take that incredibly seriously. I can't tell you how many, how many resources have gone towards that. And not just that, by the way, when there have been attacks, for instance, against the uh, uh, consulate in San Francisco, there have been thousands of hours tremendous resources, millions of dollars put into that investigation. I hope that will have a positive resolution. Nobody should be able to break the law. That's a clear action, you know, trying to set something on fire. Um, cases can be difficult because you have to put the evidence together, but I hope that something like that is a, a better example of when something clearly transcends into action and not just words. So action has been taken against those who attacked the Indian uh, mission? I can't comment on an ongoing investigation. Okay. I can say we've worked incredibly closely together on that investigation. Right. Ambassador, I want to come to the plot to assassinate Pannu. During a congressional hearing, and I'm quoting, the Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, Donald Liu, told members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I quote, uh, we are at the moment working with India to encourage India to hold accountable those responsible for this terrible crime. What we can see is that India itself has announced that they have created a committee of inquiry to look into this matter, and we ask them to work quickly and transparently to make sure justice is done. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about where the investigation is and where uh, India and the U.S. are on this? Right. So a couple of things. One, this is another piece of evidence of how strong and close our relationship really is. I mean, it's almost unthinkable a few years ago um, that we would be coordinating together to hold accountable on both sides of our borders uh, mm -hmm. criminal action, whether it was the attack in San Francisco or with something like this that has been alleged. I'm not the uh, criminal justice uh, investigator of this, so I can't comment on what our, and we, nor would we comment uh, publicly on what our criminal investigation uh, is uncovering. And that's something that's separate from our diplomatic track. We keep that, that's a police, uh, that's a FBI, that's a, a federal law enforcement and ultimately U.S. Attorney's Office investigation held very tightly. But I will say um, that I was very pleased that India put together this commission of inquiry, uh, put senior people who are experienced in law enforcement on that, and that they have been digging in on this side domestically to uncover any evidence that would show a murder for hire plot that included anybody who was from the Indian government. I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, for any of us, just abstractly, that has to be a red line. No government or government employee can be involved in the alleged assassination of one of your own citizens. 
That's mm-hmm. just an unacceptable red line. And I think that shows the seriousness with which... One of your own citizens is one of... The alleged, uh, the alleged plot is against an American citizen. So yeah, so your citizen. Exactly, the, yeah. your citizen. And, and I say that in abstract ways. The same thing would happen if, uh, hmm. if there was an American plot against some sort of... Uh, or an American government person who was trying to assassinate somebody in another country or was a part of that. That would be an unacceptable red line for any nation. That would be an American living in India... Uh, hypothetically, I'm not speaking of, uh, yeah, that's what I'm before trying the to conspiracy theorists say through. there's something out there. I'd say any country, A, any country, mm. having an active member of their government involved in a second country trying Shows, to assassinate okay. one of their citizens. That's, I think, usually a red line for any country. That's mm. a basic issue of sovereignty. That's a basic issue of rights. And, and I'm very pleased, again, this is, to use the metaphor before, if we have this incredible friendship, even marriage right now, this was maybe one of the first big conflicts, and we're actually not only coming through it, I think, strongly, but so far, everything that's been asked of the Indian government mm-hmm. has been done, and I would say vice versa. Uh, whenever there is accusations the other direction, we take that incredibly seriously. You spoke about the major conflict. I think mm-hmm. ever since you have uh, come to India, mm-hmm. this is probably the biggest uh, mm-hmm. conflict uh, situation mm-hmm. that you've dealt with, mm-hmm. isn't it? The yeah, yeah, Kanun case. And I always say, look, the test of a friendship, the, mm-hmm. fresh, the test of a relationship is not the easy times, mm-hmm. but the difficult ones. And I think not only have we, are we passing new tests, going over the largest hurdles we ever have in terms of opportunities, mm-hmm. but challenges were actually, whether they're global challenges together, mm-hmm. differences of opinions in the multilateral space, global events, or or th- things that are bilateral like this, India and the U.S. are showing their resilience and that we really want this relationship for the long haul. So as we learn each other's systems, as we have momentary conflicts, if we can get through these, I think it's a great thing for the world. Is this hurdle going to hamper India-U.S. relations in any manner? I don't believe so. In fact, I've said the pace of work for every conspiracy theorist who said, oh, it was going so well, and then at the end of the year, this is a hiccup. So we haven't slowed down one bit. In fact, we've accelerated our work on education. We've accelerated our work on technology. We've accelerated our work on military relations. We've accelerated our work on trade. These things are even going faster than ever. So while this is an incredibly important principle for us, it's an incredibly important issue for us. Uh, So far, like I said, we've been satisfied with the coordination on this particular issue and it hasn't slowed a single thing down. You know, I, I get when you talk about military cooperation, people to people cooperation, Everything that trade issues mm-hmm. um, and Indian students going, several issues where we are cooperating. Mm-hmm. But then the Khalistan issue is something which is so emotive. Mm-hmm. And it seems to us Indians that the Americans are tone deaf to understand that we have gone through hell in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And if on Khalistan we cannot come on the same page, it's extremely hard. If you remember, I don't know if you can recall going back right to the 80s yes. when uh, Rajiv Gandhi as Prime Minister had gone to D.C. and there he was accosted uh, by a separatist, a Khalistani. And at that time, Rajiv Gandhi as Prime Minister, and I'm talking about 35 years ago, sure. where he was, he turned around and he said that if there is a Khalistan, it's in your country. It's not here. So since then, India has been through fire on mm-hmm. the Khalistan issue. And it seems like we are back to the same page where we just don't trust the Americans mm-hmm. on the Khalistan issue. Why are Americans stone deaf to that? Well, I, I would, again, reframe it. I don't think that we are at all. Many of us know that history. Mm-hmm. have dear, close friends who had members of their family killed, uh, who witnessed barbarity on in the streets of this city right here in response, an assassination of a prime minister, people being killed because of their religion and their heads on sticks. We know that history. And I talked to an Indian friend who said, look, don't try to be rational with us and don't try to be caring with us. It's this, and he pointed to the backside of his brain. He's like, it's this piece, the traumatized brain, that whenever you talk to an Indian about this issue that is speaking. Conversely, I think in the United States, the strength of that feeling isn't enough to break the law that we have. And it's very important for us to not only be sensitive and to work more closely than ever. Anybody out there who says we're tone deaf, we've never worked more closely with Indian law enforcement on people who happen to be part of criminal networks who are working in my state, in California, for instance. We've taken down, arrested. We're working on deportations together, on extraditions rather, together now. We're coordinating cases in a way that we never did. If there wasn't trust there, how could we do that? It's deep trust. Talk to somebody inside, you know, one of the criminal investigative units here in India working with their counterparts in the United States. They know each other's names. They talk daily. You know, these are a a level of coordination that's never existed. So we can restate that narrative over and over. It doesn't make it the truth. 
I know that. I have deep sensitivities to that. And we're not just saying, hey, we are never going to look at these things. We look at every single accusation, but the strength of emotion also doesn't make it inherently violate our laws. So one of the things I always state to my American friends is, it's true, sometimes in the diaspora, these movements are so much stronger than here, where there is a, a quite unified country. You know, India, like ours, is a complex, diverse democracy. That's a tough thing to manage. And I've been so impressed with what I've seen on the ground here in managing that. Um, but I don't think we should keep restating something that isn't true because the level of the coordination of cooperation and understanding of history does exist there. If we say it over and over, people will believe it, but that's not my day-to-day -day experience is, at all. It is true to state it over and over again is because um, you've been mayor of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You know what in, in the West Coast, there are Khalistan parades which are held. Yuba City has Khalistan parades. They have an Indian prime minister's assassination on a tableau. They have all this. And it's Khalistan is now an American problem. It's not an Indian problem. So it, just like Taliban wasn't just an Afghanistan problem, it became, and Al-Qaeda was not just an Afghanistan problem, it became America's problem. And today there is no Khalistan in India. There's no Khalistan movement in India. It's in Yuba City. It's in Vancouver. It's in Surrey. It's in North America. It's two different systems. Look, in the United States, we have people who march and say things that are abhorrent to us. You know, I, I live in a country where I listen to people who say abhorrent things all the time. When I was president of our city council, people had protected hate speech. They could say horrible things about your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, we have people who talk about not wanting to be a part of America. Our system protects that speech, for better or for worse. It's mm -hmm. never nice. We have a philosophy, I think, that comes from you. You fight speech with more speech. Um, and that can be foreign, I know, to the Indian ear sometimes. That can be a strange system. They can say, why don't you just arrest people for what they say? Uh, we don't have that system. I, as ambassador, can't change that rule. I don't know if I'd want to, it's even while it hurts us sometimes, things that are just about America, not even talking about India at all, mm -hmm. what people say. As a Jew, I, I had people who stood on um, you know, a, a freeway overpass in my city condemning Jews, yeah. and they're not arrested. Uh, if they threaten violence, hmm. they can be. But it's also a slippery slope. Once you start doing arresting for what people say, that can go really extreme. Mm -hmm. And so it's the American philosophy not to, but again, I'd keep coming back to this. Mm. A, to give a caricature of all Americans of Indian descent, that they are secessionists is not true. And I think it's unfair to Sikh Americans, it's unfair to Indian Americans. This caricature that sometimes comes out of here that America is just this hotbed of people who hate India, that's not true at all either. Okay. I mean, I know my fellow Angelinos, Californians and Americans who are part of this amazing bridge between our two countries, who have done that for years. The first member of Congress who was Asian American was actually Indian American and he was Sikh and he was from Southern California in the 1950s when Indians, uh, immigrants faced all sorts of discrimination and that's an amazing part of our civil rights history. So again, it's really easy to paint a white or a black, it's not in America at all. And while there may be some frustrating parts of our system and vice versa, <laughs> That doesn't mean that needs to stand in the way of our progress, the friendship, and the depth of this relationship, which is unprecedented. You spoke about uh, the Indian diaspora, so let me come to that. Um, you, uh, on the green card backlog issue, 3% of those who submitted their uh, applications are expected to get their GC this year. The backlog is 34.7 million, and that's mostly Indians uh, who are on the backlog. Yeah. Can you give me a little uh, clarity on what is the wait list like and when mm -hmm. is it going to happen? I believe uh, in some cases it's more than a century's wait. Right, it is. No, part of this is a legislative problem that mm -hmm. Congress uh, will have to address on whether it's the number of legal immigrants, the number of green cards, or the number of people who can become citizens. There's just limits on that. Like any country, I'm sure there's limits here sure. too. Um, and that is frustrating for Indians, I think, because there's so many Indians who want to come to America. And that's a great part of our news, by the way. Second only to Mexicans um, were Indian uh, uh, visas last year. The n biggest number of students, double the second biggest, yeah. uh, last year over 245,000 student visas came from India. 
number one in mm -hmm. adoptions, number one in all these categories that show, you know, 1.4 billion people, a lot of them would love to come to America. And so it's a good problem to have. But a couple things were changing. One is helping people of H-1Bs not have to go out of the country to get those renewed. That's going to happen, I hope, with their families soon. We've uh, here in um, not just Delhi, but across India, increased 60% in a single year with the same number of people, the number of visas that we adjudicated hmm. and brought down wait times by 75%. So again, that would be more a question for Congress to resolve. I, I certainly would love to see the ability for us to welcome more Indian immigrants legally, welcome more to become green card holders, and also in strategic sectors that where we need that sort of uh, workforce. And we've seen how beneficial that has been in our healthcare, in our tech, and other places. So while other countries, I think sometimes their immigrants say, why are you helping Indians so much? You know, we're helping those who help themselves and we're seeing the positive outcomes. Does of that happen? The Indian Do people bridge. come and ask you that? Why Indians? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Indians complain about Indians, as they should, you know, and yeah. we actually are very responsive. It's a huge priority for me, for the president. But the rest of the countries are like, wait a second, that doesn't even, res that isn't even proportionate to the large population of Indians when they have a quarter of the student visas, when they have, you know, the largest yeah. group of, of H-1Bs by far. Um, so India is doing quite well in our system. And our system, I think, uh, is looking at how it can continue to improve and maybe even expand the numbers. But that will requ require Democrats, Republicans, and independents to come together. To come together. Uh, two points that you mentioned. One is the 75% um, uh, time Decrease. Yeah, on the visa appointment. And this, uh, the other one is the 245,000 students, applicants. So let me get to the visa appointment mm -hmm. first. Uh, 250 days mm -hmm. wait, despite the 75% mm -hmm. um, uh, time limit reduced. So how will uh, how will you streamline this? Yeah. Well, the 250 is still a long wait. It is, and, and too too high for me. The president said, Eric, I want you to bring down visa wait times mm. in India. I'm, I think it's probably the first time a president ever said that to an ambassador in any country. I don't think presidents even Get focus <laughs> on visa wait times, but we all have so many Indian friends who are saying, why is this taking so long yeah. that it even went up to the president? So the reality of that 250 is an average, and I think the, um, the typical person is actually under 200 days uh, already. Mm -hmm. It's difficult with the existing resources. So one of two different things we're doing. One is we've talked about opening two new consulates in the near future. One in Bangalore, another one that will be in Ahmedabad. Mm -hmm. Two, we've working with the Ministry of External Affairs to put more bodies in India and they've been very responsive and helpful. For instance, we opened up in Hyderabad, the newest, most expensive, most beautiful consulate yeah. anywhere in the world for the U.S. But it was only the counters were only one third filled because we didn't have enough people approved by the Indian government to come work here. And then mm -hmm. we have to, of course, hire them. And last year, as part of the state visit, there was an agreement on that. MEA did a wonderful job, allowed us to hire more. And so you'll see a couple dozen more people come on board this year. Third, we're shipping it out. We have people doing remote adjudications in Washington, mm -hmm. in China, where the number of people getting mm -hmm. visas has gone way down, um, and other places around the world. So if there's a consular officer who doesn't have enough work in another country, they're working on Indian visas too. So okay. people around the world, more bodies, uh, looking at future consulates, and then just improving our systems and seeing what ways we can do. But remember, there's 5 million Indians that today already have visas that are good for about a decade to come as tourists. This is only for tourist first time visits the rest there's no wait time in all the other categories for the first time in years sounds good let's get to the student visas and the yes. students who are going um uh, ambassador you know uh, uh, 245000 students that yeah. you spoke about but off late there is you know there are these indian students mm -hmm. uh, the attack on indian students so can you just uh, yeah. uh, you know there are a number of indian parents who are watching this podcast students who are watching who are going to be applying and especially some of them who have uh, already got acceptance right. from american campuses uh, there was also a video podcast by indra nui who uh, explained as to what indian students should mm -hmm. watch out for when they work when they go for studying to the us which campuses and mm -hmm. how to be safe and secure so could you tell me about yeah. the safety of Indian students? Of course. Well, first and foremost, to any families, and I've talked to some of those families who have faced a tragedy with their own son or daughter. I mean, our hearts go out. We take the justice issues very seriously of bringing to justice any perpetrators. With, you know, a quarter million now a year, statistically, this is going to happen. Um, hmm. 
but that's not acceptable to a parent if it happens to your child. Sure. So there are things we can do just to be aware, to have a heads up, to know mm -hmm. which neighborhoods you should mm -hmm. and shouldn't go into that are higher crime areas. The same sort of advice we give travelers when they mm -hmm. go around the world, including to places like India. We know that these things can happen, but you can play a role in lessening the risk. Um, go with friends. Um, make sure that you always have a person who's keeping an eye on you and that you can check in on. And look, these are very different cases. Sometimes it might be somebody with mental health issues and it could be a suicide. Other times it's an attack. Um, we don't know if it's a hate crime or if it's just a random attack because mm -hmm. somebody was robbing somebody. But crime happens. Tragedies happen. And the best way you can prevent is by knowing your city, uh, talking to your campus safety people about the safest ways to get on transportation, the safest places to be, and ensuring that you know that there are certain reckless behaviors that you should engage in, that obviously illegal drug use is not something you should be trying in the United States of America. Yeah. Um, that can be a pathway towards um, all sorts of bad things. So it was a series of those suggestions, and we're looking at how we can better package those together with the Indian government, just to let new students know, come, come to America, you know, statistically, it's going to be an extremely safe, very enjoyable thing. But to ensure that you aren't uh, in, enmeshed in any tragedy, here are things you can do to protect yourself. Yes, because uh, at least for my generation, parents used to think that, oh, sending your kids to America, uh, kids can take public transport. Mm -hmm. Cases of muggings mm -hmm. don't happen mm -hmm. unless you're going into the inner mm -hmm. city area mm -hmm. or something. At least near college campuses, mm -hmm. this didn't happen. But now increasing reports, of course, statistically, as you yeah. said. So um, the law and order situation in many of these college uh, cities, mm -hmm. um, it is a a source of worry for parents who are sending kids. Uh, yeah. I, I know of many parents who say, I, I'd rather send, I'm making the option of sending them to Australia mm -hmm. or sending them to even New Zealand, mm -hmm. but not America, yeah. not Canada. I'm worried about the hate crimes right. in these uh, cities in sure. in North America. So, uh, yeah. of course, it's not fair to ask uh, you to speak about the situation in Canada, mm -hmm. but generally, mm -hmm. uh, would you say that there's cause for worry or there isn't? No, I think there's there's always just safe things to do, but there's not, I mean, crime has gone down, violent crime, especially in the last few years. Mm -hmm. It's much safer than it was in the 1970s and 1980s when I think part of it is just that we can find these cases very quickly. We now have media, social media that really lessens the space between uh, distant places. We might not have heard of it, it back then, but it is a safe place to come. We encourage Indian uh, students to come. We love our Indian students. And there's also things that whether you're in America, whether you're in Canada, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in New Zealand, whether you're here in India, that you should do to make sure you're safe. Uh, let me come to your story. Sure. Right? <laughs> uh, I saw your interview with Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. Um, there was also this situation where people talked about you being, uh, you know, uh, running for president and then two years for you to get approved to come here mm. as ambassador. So tell me that story. <laughs> well, American politics is, as any observer will show, going through a very dynamic uh, period. But I really think that leadership, my philosophy has always been that leadership for nations comes from local communities, which is why I spent 21 years in local government. It's where you see people's faces. It's where you learn their names. You meet their families. You improve their street, their community. And I loved that. And I feel sometimes that in our country, Washington, D.C. had become disconnected from that, mm -hmm. that um, listening to America's communities. I started an organization called Accelerator for America. Mm -hmm. It was really about listening to solutions for America's problems, through our local communities and understanding our deepest challenges, whether it was economic development, jobs, women's empowerment, from the perspective of everyday Americans, not just the most empowered. Um, ultimately, I decided not to run for president because I didn't think I could do a good job finishing what I told voters I would do, which is to be their mayor. Voters in Los, Angeles, in Los Angeles, just in case. In, our, so I, for, for nine and a half years, I was very, very uh, honored to be the mayor of Los Angeles, our second biggest city. Kind of more like the chief minister title here than what we call mm. mayors here, which mayors in India are more like the city council president, which was my job before that. Um, but, you know, then going through confirmation, I was very proud. I got a bipartisan, strong vote in the end, Republicans mm. and Democrats, even as somebody who was a Democrat. Um, a lot of people vote against you just because of your party affiliation. Mm -hmm. And we have some people who really restored my faith in democracy saying, look, I don't care if you're a Democrat. I know who you are. I know you've had a long history with India, a professor of international relations, a military officer, that you've done the sorts of things that make you eminently qualified. And they, quote unquote, crossed over the line, which is done less and less in America these days. 
I think any democracy can fight out its differences, but also has to find its common values. And mm -hmm. um, so luckily the confirmation, for me, the good news of the delay was I got to serve out my very last day as mayor. I never felt like I left the voters of LA even one day early, had a couple month break, and then I was here. Was it a consolation prize coming to India? Not at all, no. This was. This is the most sought out, if you look at the people who have been here, from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who went on to be one of our most famous politicians, great senators, UN ambassador, um, from John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who was probably one of the greatest economists who's ever lived and a close friend of the Kennedys. I think what the president told me, because he asked me to join the cabinet, but I couldn't leave uh, my city in the midst of the uh, Omicron, crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. People were dying in my city and I said that's the last thing I would do Mr. President if you really want me um, you can you know keep pushing but I would prefer to stay here and it was a few months later he said I really need you to consider a, a huge job and that tradition of somebody close to the president I was his campaign co-chair I uh, helped lead the vice presidential search and chaired his inauguration um, he said I need one of my very closest people he said I'd love to have you by my side here at the White House but consider this. And when he said the word India, he had me at hello. Because since I came here when I was 14 years old, this country has captured my heart. Um, and in some way, I think it was a combination 50% Joe Biden, 50% India that pulled me back to a place I always dreamed of living in. What did you do when you came in when you were 14? How come? My parents brought me here with my sister. It was just a, a trip. They wanted us to see the world and to understand the world. They had a very diverse background. My father is Mexican-American, my mother's Jewish-American. They grew up on opposite sides of the track, but they met and they were both working for Pan Am Airlines. And so if they had an extra dollar in their bank account, they didn't put it into a nicer home or a bigger car. They took Bought us on a, a trip. a Pan Am ticket? Well, yeah, well, until Pan Am went bankrupt. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, youngsters today won't even know. They'll have to Google what to see is. what is Pan Am. Check it out. It's a great logo, yeah. too. And so yeah. I think it was on a Pan Am flight. We came yeah. here when I was 14. Um, spent two weeks here. Where? Um, we went everywhere. We went to Mumbai. We went to Ajanta Nalora. We went to Varanasi. We went to um, Jaipur. We went to Udaipur. We went to, of course, to Delhi. I mean, we saw a lot of places. And then the most incredible thing, and he, he is here today as we speak. I went Your to dad? university. No, my parents were here. But my college roommate, Jared uh -huh. Clark, who was randomly assigned to me, you know, you get a roommate to share a room yeah, with yeah, two beds yeah. in one room. He, uh, my second year of university, I started taking Hindi and Urdu because of, of having been here when I was 14. He said, guess what? My dad, who's in the foreign service, just became the U.S. ambassador to India. Do you want to come visit? Mm. And so, and everybody gets chills when I tell them the story. I do still. I said, of course. And I came here the second time, stayed at Roosevelt House, which is the ambassador's residence here in the embassy. And I never would have dreamed that, you know, some decades later, I would come back as the ambassador. And Jared is visiting with his wife here. We actually went to Roosevelt House yesterday for him to take a tour of this place he lived in. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was sold on India um, from the very beginning. You know, uh, for our viewers who'd get a little confused over why you would visit Roosevelt mm. House, uh, maybe you'd like to tell us sure. about the renovation <laughs> and things that's going on. So part of our growing relationship with India is that we're bursting at the seams. So not only the new consulate at Hyderabad, the two new consulates, hopefully, that will open up in Ahmedabad and, and Bengaluru, um, we're building a new embassy. Um, we're going to keep the existing one as an important historic uh, building, but uh, we'll be breaking ground. We've already started breaking ground. So the ambassador's residence that I would live in is totally sealed up so that it doesn't get harmed by the construction. And maybe the next ambassador or two ambassadors from now will live back in Roosevelt House. So I'm in temporary quarters until then. You know, um, you spoke about uh, Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, friend of India. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you spoke about President Biden asking you to come to India. While you say, and uh, we've seen that too, those who have, of us who have done the beat journalism, um, we know that it took two years of very excruciatingly painful bureaucratic tussle yes. to get a U.S. ambassador to India. But Indians at that time were like, maybe we don't figure in mm. uh, the American scheme of things because for two years, if uh, America doesn't appoint anybody to India and now India doesn't have an ambassador mm. in D.C., does that mean that the post of D.C. really, uh, the post of ambassador really mm. doesn't matter between these two countries? Well, I'll say this, with no ambassador, you still have tens of thousands of people working on this relationship all the time. Mm -hmm. At the university level, at the department or ministry level, 
um, our national security advisors, our president and prime minister. No one person is this relationship dependent on. But I will say having an ambassador exponentially accelerates that work. Mm -hmm. And I think it was quite the contrary. It wasn't that the U.S. didn't care about India. It's that our president said, we want to send somebody very senior, very mm -hmm. close to me, the president, that people will know has the ear of the president directly, as we had in the past. And we're going to stick to that until we get that. And in the meantime, by the way, it wasn't that we didn't have an, a chief of mission. We had incredible former ambassadors who came here to fill in that time, really seasoned hands who were great. But I hope, um, and I have to thank India and the Indian people who have embraced me so warmly. I mean, mm -hmm. everywhere I go around India, people are like, oh, you're the ambassador. They want to come take, I probably take a thousand pictures a week, you know, with mm -hmm. Indians that meet their children, um, eat their food, like go into their homes. It's been an amazing experience. And I think that the president was wise in saying we will push this, get through it, because we want somebody who can help elevate this um, relationship. And the timing was perfect. I came in. We had the state visit from the prime minister, who by all accounts was his most successful yeah. foreign trip ever. And vice versa, we had the president come here for an incredibly successful G20, which India deserves so much credit. The most successful G20, I think, in history, and certainly the most wide-ranging. Mm. Um, to me, that sealed the deal. Somebody told me who was an ambassador. If you get one visit from your president in four years or something when you're ambassador or your head of government in the country you're in visits Washington once, you're lucky. I had both in the first four months. Yeah. And that wasn't just them. We had our, our cabinet and your cabinet all the time engaging with each other. That's mm. extraordinary. Number one country for military exercises right now. In fact, we have one underway as we speak. Oh dear. Yeah. Now, now you're going to the military exercises. I was just <laughs> about to go on the leadership no, go ahead, thing. Please. Let's, let's go to the military exercises okay, right. now that you've <laughs> talked about military exercises. You know, when we speak about areas of convergence, uh, defense sector is uh, very important. Two things that I want to ask you about, the Predator drones, uh, drones and the yes. jet engines. Uh, where are the negotiations stuck right now? They're not stuck at all. So the Predator drones moved forward. Now it's uh, we're awaiting India's uh, for last signature, essentially, but it went through the congressional notification. It was accelerated. It went ahead of some other things. It jumped the queue, showing the priority and how important we saw this deal. Um, and even in the quote unquote, some people were predicting rockier times because of what we talked about earlier. It actually went through and shows the strength of this relationship. So those are in a great place. Um, and then the engines uh, also, we, you know, that will take years for engines to be made because they're very complicated, most exquisite technology we've ever shared with anybody, including some of our closest allies that we have not hmm. shared this kind of technology with. But both are 100% on track. We're satisfied. Indians are satisfied. Um, my job is, and I think uh, my Indian counterparts would say the same, is to help GE and uh, HAL, which is the local manufacturer here, domestic manufacturer, try to get their ecosystems uh, accelerated so that we can see those in Indian planes sooner than later. So this, uh, the transfer of strategic technology, mm -hmm. um, we are not your, uh, we are not a NATO ally. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a strategic partner. Mm -hmm. uh, does the transfer of technology happen smoothly or will there be roadblocks? No, it happens very smoothly. You actually prefer a defense partner, which is a very high level, very unique and something that happened a couple years ago between US and India. And I hope it's the beginning of many things. We're looking at armored cars and howitzers together. We need to develop also weapons that can confront the new nature of war. We're seeing this, you know, in the Red Sea right now, that um, cheap uh, drones and other, uh, you know, cheaply made missiles can only be brought down today by a million dollar mm. um, missile in defense. The nature of warfare is changing. And I think that U.S. and India are looking for solutions together, which is why Indus X, we started matching startups in the defense sector of the U.S. and India together to co-develop and maybe someday co-produce some of the answers to these challenges. Before my next question, here's a short primer on the Citizenship Amendment Act and the fracas that ensued after the U.S. State Department made a comment on it. At a media conclave in New Delhi, Ambassador Garcetti commented on an Indian legislation and said, and I quote, religious freedom is a cornerstone of democracy. The US can't give up on that principle. He further said, you can't give up on principles no matter how close you are with friends or if it comes to that, your worst enemy, when those are principles that you stand for. 
the bill that was being discussed was the Citizenship Amendment Act. The Indian government had notified the rules for implementation of the CAA, which was passed by the parliament over four years ago. The rules allow for minorities persecuted on religious grounds in Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan to acquire citizenship in India, but it does not accord this privilege to Muslim minority groups in the essentially Islamic nations. The Ministry of External Affairs MEA spokesperson Randhir Jaiswal reacted sharply to the US State Department spokesperson who had commented on the CAA. He called it, and I quote, misplaced, misinformed and unwarranted. He said about the CAA that it's an internal matter of India and is in keeping with India's inclusive traditions and our long-standing commitment to human rights. He also said, India's constitution guarantees freedom of religion to all its citizens. There are no grounds for any concern on treatment of minorities. Vote bank politics should not determine views about a laudable initiative to help those in distress, said the MEA spokesperson. He also said sharply that lectures by those who have limited understanding of India's pluralistic traditions and the region's post-partition history are best not attempted. And then he said partners and well-wishers of India should welcome the intent with which this step has been taken. These sentiments were also echoed by the Indian External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar. One question is that at a, what happened with you, at a recent conclave uh, you spoke about... Uh, Human Rights and Citizens mm. Amendment Bill, mm. uh, that became a little bit of uh, a naughty affair. Then the State Department spokesperson said something about it. Um, and that became complicated because the Indian uh, External Affairs Ministry spokesperson, he said that uh, partners, and I quote, partners and well-wishers of India should welcome the intent which this step has been taken. Do you see this as a problem area mm. now with an in American ambassador commenting on India's internal affairs? No, I, I, it was the State Department that spoke first, and mm. I just reiterated the State Department's position. So I wasn't making news, and we should get the sequence correctly. Okay. Uh, we, it's something that we monitor, and I said that. And I mm. said in, in broad strokes that religious freedom is an important part of any democracy. Um, mm. uh, protecting minorities is very important. That doesn't have to be read negatively. Yes. Uh, political sledging happens, mm. uh, you know, as elections come mm. closer. So any statement uh, would take wind of its own. I mean, like if an Indian ambassador was to say, comment on the judicial system uh, of America, that would uh, that would be seen as yeah. interference. And, and I think it's the job of monitoring what happens. That's the job of an ambassador. That's the job of a State Department, Ministry of External Affairs job and Indian ambassador's job is to monitor and to report. And we simply said that if, mm. if people want to read new words besides that into it, they can, but that so doesn't this, mean... You know, um, degrees of separation because then everybody connects it that America gets its cues from the Five Eyes instead of the intel cooperation that happens no. between India and the US. Let me just dispel, you know, when I was a city council member, once there was a person speaking, we have uh, the ability to petition directly. So we have citizen mm -hmm. comments every meeting. And one of them said, this is a conspiracy. You guys are going to vote this way. We know this is cooked and nobody's listening to what we're saying. And this veteran politician turned to me and said, you know, Eric, the problem with conspiracy theories is no one's smart enough to pull them off. I say 99.9% .9 of people's conspiracy theories is not the way the world actually works. We have a deep friendship. It's very respectful. Sometimes we can agree to disagree on things and continue mm -hmm. with our business, and we shouldn't take it with thin skin. We shouldn't take it personally. Uh, certainly, I open up the United States, I say all the time, from a place of humility. We have a ton of flaws. We're open to criticisms. We want to listen. But I think the most important thing for all of us is to find common international law that we can all be a part of, try to implement equally, and respect the specific histories that every country has. And mm. the more that you know about that, the better positioned you are when you are monitoring things to be able to comment. Uh, finally, I'd like to ask you about the chemistry between uh, President Joe Biden and uh, Prime Minister Modi. Both are going in for re-election. Um, your president has said, and I quote, uh, that uh, the partnership with uh, India is uh, the most consequential in the world. Um, is it hyperbole or is it really true? He has said that privately. He told that to me. He said, Eric, you know, this is the most important country in the world to me when he was asking me to become ambassador. Now, I love Joe Biden. We're dear, deep friends for many, many years. I figured, oh, it's just Joe Biden. He says this to every ambassador. Mm -hmm. that France is the most important country. Mexico is the most important country. But he wasn't lying. He meant it because I heard him say it that uh, directly in the Oval Office to the Prime Minister, that this is the most consequential relationship. And if your listeners take one thing away from this, it's so easy to get caught up in 
what the uh, psychologist Sigmund Freud once called the narcissism of small differences, right? We did a lot of that in this podcast. Well, isn't it this, or you agree, this freedom of speech is this way, and aren't, isn't there a conspiracy about that? The reality is Indians, look at it in polls, love Americans. Yeah. The reality is Americans love Indians. The bridge has never been stronger. The work that we're doing has never been more important. And it's consequential not just for India and for the United States, it's consequential for the world. The big fight isn't between each other and these small differences we sometimes have. The big fight is between extremist ideology, dictatorship. We have two democracies that, yes, we have to fight to defend domestically all the time and hopefully internationally the concept of democracy. But is there any country that you'd rather be in than India? For me, as an American, is there any other relationship you'd rather be engaged in? I would certainly not. This is the most exciting place to be in the world right now, the intersection of the United States and America. And I love Indians. I love India. And it's been the honor of my life to be here. You've been traveling a lot in yeah. India. What part of India really fascinated you and you had to rethink about the, you know, if you had any personal uh, yeah. views about that part of right. India earlier. I, I don't know if it was that I had personal views because I've traveled a lot um, in my life here, but I've been to 22 states now and in, in Union Territories. Yeah. As Is that a record now for an Indian an, amba an American ambassador? I mean, a couple of them went to all of them, but in 11 months it may be a record because yeah. in the shortness of time. But a couple places, I mean, when I was up in Himachal Pradesh, I mean, um, uh, Arunachal Pradesh mm -hmm. too, from one side of the Himalayas to the other, just the breathtaking beauty. Um, Nagaland, the incredible culture that was in that state during the Hornbill Festival. Um, Kanyakumari in the south. I loved being in the water. Probably as the, one of the only non-Indians greeting the sunlight in front of the Vivekananda statue and feeling the intersection of three bodies of water and the greeting of a new day. I'm, it's, it's breathtaking to me. The more you know about India, the more you know you don't know. Mm -hmm. It's almost an unquenchable thirst. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm going to get to all 36 uh, states and union territories. And um, I hope the most important thing, because you have a little bit of a bubble as ambassador, is I can get to some rural life, some villages, and really talk to everyday Indians about their dreams and what we can do to help those dreams in the future. I cannot conclude without asking you about cricket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> India-Pakistan cricket match happening the first time in the United yes, States. Yes. Are you going to attend it? Have you done any kind of cricket playing or cricket yes. watching? I've gone from a, a hardcore baseball player to a huge cricket fan. Mm -hmm. um, probably the biggest accomplishment many Indian friend said that I did was a combination of my last job and this one is I got to announce here that we're putting cricket into the Los Angeles Olympics and it'll become an Olympic sport for the first time in 2028 and I announced that in Mumbai a few months back. Um, yeah, I play with our, uh, um, our uh, embassy team. Mm -hmm. I've gone to a lot of IPL matches. I went to some World Cup ones too. Um, I love cricket and I can explain it in a minute to um, any Americans who say, I don't understand the game. So I'm like a cricket ambassador Seriously? and I hope to get to the game in New York, but I'm really excited. We have a major league cricket league now in the United States. And long after I'm ambassador, you can count on me to be in the stands in Los Angeles. Hopefully when we finally build a pitch around the Olympics, um, watching a good cricket game with my Indian friends. And I saw the video which you had about eating gujia oh, since yeah. we are in the holy season. Yes. Uh, so Indian food, you're taking to it? I didn't have to take to it. It's always been a part of my life. I've cooked in Indian LA. food. Yeah. Um, you know, I've loved Indian food. But I love going to each of the Bawans here in, in Delhi and sampling all the states. And yeah, the, the way to my heart is through my stomach, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, the spices, uh, they don't bother you? No, no, I love the spices. I'm half Mexican. So this thing where, let me announce this to all of our Indian friends. When you see Americans, you say, oh, we've toned down the spices. A lot of Americans, mm -hmm. depending on their backgrounds, and by the way, you don't have to be Mexican-American, love spicy. In fact, I want to do a contest and maybe have the Mexican ambassador, Peruvian ambassador, Thai ambassador, um, you know, Korean ambassador, and somebody representing India and myself, who can take the spiciest the, the, the chili. Uh, maybe A and I can do that. Yeah, can sponsor it. That would be really interesting. <laughs> have you tried that? The, in fact, there is a Clinton Thali in one of yeah, the right, restaurants right. because the Clintons love Indian oh, yeah. food and that really set the pattern because every uh, subsequent president had to go through the Thali yes, test. Yes, of course. <laughs> the well, Thali test is an important one. I mean, yeah. if, if you don't know, you, like I wake up most mornings with Choli Baturi, like is my first, you know, taste of the day. Uh, if you can't pass your Indian like Mitai test and if you don't know your specifics, you're not going to do well. But if you do, Indians really connect with you. I think cricket and food are the yeah. ways to connect. Yes. I think when I visited Shah Rukh Khan my first uh, couple weeks yes. here and we talked cricket because, of course, he's involved as a cricket owner. He owns part of the Los Angeles team. Yeah. Um, 
all, everybody in my office went nuts. They're like, oh my God, did you know who you met? I said, yeah, Shah Rukh Khan. But I didn't realize the level of <laughs> love that there was across the country. Yes. And it's, it's an amazing thing He's to see quite Bollywood, a legend. to see cricket, to see food. To me, that's the way, that's the fun of this job is not just policy, but people. Because in the end of the day, people will come and go who are politicians. But if we know each other, that will sustain for our lives. Because that's what uh, your job initially was, right? You're yeah. you're more of a people's person. Yeah. You uh, That's why there was talk about you running and you went to right. the primary states also. Yeah. At that yeah. time, it was like, okay, yeah. he's going to be running for president. <laughs> so you're more a people's person and diplomacy is a lot about people-to-people -people exactly. contact, right? Yep. Yep. And this relationship too, India-US relationship, people-to-people yeah. -people driven. And, and I hope that I can bring more of the Indian people to America because I think the bridge from here to America is very strong. Indians really know Americans and Everybody has a cousin or a friend yes. or a child in America. Not enough Americans have come to India. Mm -hmm. You know, more American students studied in Costa Rica last year than here in India. They know a couple things, you know, they know butter chicken and naan, but they don't realize that Indian food is this incredible diverse tableau. Um, they don't have enough experience visiting the places here. And I really want to bring more America and more Americans to India. And I hope that'll be part of my legacy as ambassador. Thank you so much, sir, for spending this time and explaining demystifying India-U.S. relations. Absolutely. And uh, we didn't get into the details about uh, U.S. trade relations, India-U.S. trade relations. Hopefully the next time. Segment two. Stay Se tuned. Danyavad. Thank you. Thank you for watching and listening to this edition of the ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Namaste. Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.